bit of still picking on me. Those recruits were all like these young people, man, straight A students, weren't they? No, they weren't. But anyway, uh, no, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Julius was a blessing in my life. I had just come here from the University of Florida, and he was my academic advisor. And, and it, it's true, I would bring in some, some athletes that were really good, which I'll get to in a moment. They were very talented, but they really didn't pay attention to their academics. And uh, I would kind of lay that on Julius and say, Julius, we've got to get this young guy into school. And then, lo and behold, Julius would work overtime, and I'm so sorry to his wife and children, but he worked overtime and overtime and overtime, and then that young guy would get drafted in June and be offered $5 million, and I don't know why, but they would take the money instead of coming to the University of Arizona. I still can't figure that out. I mean, $5 million or come to class and go to study hall and get up and live to 6 in the morning, or $5 million, but we never had one take that, they, they all took that money, so. Something went wrong there. But uh, listen, I am really honored, I'm, I, and I say that with all sincerity. I played Pop Warner football. I'm a Los Angeles kid. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, and I was sharing with a couple of people here. I, I played Pop Warner football as a quarterback and throwing interceptions all over, not reading where the safety was and all the rest of the madness. Uh, and in my high school career, in, in my coaching life, um, I was a high school uh, baseball coach and a high school football coach my first five years out of coming out of UCLA. I was drafted by the Detroit Tigers, and that's another story in itself. I didn't, I didn't sign a professional contract, so I went right into coaching. I was a 23-year-old high school baseball coach and football coach. So, uh, so I know the realm of what you guys and, and the ladies, the cheerleaders too. I'm, I'm not gonna excuse you from that or, or miss you on that one, but, uh, but I know that realm, so to speak. But in reality, what you're all doing and what you do on a day and day basis um, is so important. And I, I'm speaking to the adults now. I'm speaking to all the adults, the coaches, those of you that are involved in putting on an event like this. Um, I don't really know if you truly understand this. People ask me all the time. I, I was a head coach for 38 years. Five of, them at the, five of them at the high school level and 33 at the college level. So for 38 years, I got up every day and I had the responsibility of trying to get young people to do what they sometimes didn't want to do, and on top of that, win enough games so you don't get fired. Because that's, that's what I did, you know. Win some games or they're gonna fire you, right? But anyway, uh, and I'm not sure I really understood how important my job was, and, and I kind of kicked myself at that. Um, because the reality of it is that all you adults are making an impression on a young life right now. And, and all that you do, day in and day out, it's an unbelievable thing. I, I like I said, I, I retired in 2015 from, from, uh, from the University of Arizona. I had heart surgery in 2013. That's where Judas and I have the same cardiologist. And uh, and I, I did it for about a year and a half after that and realized it's time for me to get out and let someone else get in there. And, and so my players will come back to me now. And one of the things I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna give you something today. I'm gonna give you something that you can take with you the rest of your life. I'm gonna give all of you even some of the adults, really. But mainly the young people, I'm gonna give you something today that you can take with you the rest of your life. It's been with me for 38 years as a head coach. Every player that's ever played for me, I coached in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Alaska, Florida, Los Angeles, Tucson, Arizona. Every player that ever played for me, every player that ever stepped on a field with me knows what I'm gonna give you today. And you'll be able to use it. I guarantee you'll be able to use it. I use it in my own life every single day. Every single day I use this little thing that I'm gonna to give to you in a moment. But to the adults, again, you, you really have no idea what a, a, an event like this does for a young person's life. Uh, I'm gonna give you a quick, really quick background on my life so you can see where I'm at. My mom and dad are both from Mexico. My mom and dad are both home with the Lord now. But my mom, my mom was born in Agua Preta, my dad in Juarez. They did not speak the English language. My father gained his citizenship by joining the Second World War and served in the Pacific Theater for two and a half years. My father worked from 5.30 at night till 3.30 in the morning. Uh, I'm from a play little town called San Pedro, California. It's a harbor town down there if anybody's been to Los Angeles, kind of by Long Beach in that area, about 20, 30 miles south of LAX. Uh, my mom cleans, cleaned homes for a living. She never drove a car in her life. My sister got pregnant at 16. Uh, she's seven years older than I am. My brother's 11 years older than I am. When I got old enough, I asked my mom and dad, I said, hey, uh, I wasn't planned, huh? <laughs> Seriously, one day I asked my mom and dad, hey mom, I wasn't planned, was I? 
Oh, mijo, no, mijo, your plan, your plan. I said, no, mom. John's 11 years older and Chacha, well, her name's Teresa, but we call her Chacha. Chacha's seven years older. What happened? <laughs> All right, but here's the thing. I was blessed. I was blessed by a father with unbelievable integrity and showed me how to work hard. I was blessed by a mother who never drove a car in her life, took the buses everywhere. I drove her around, my sister drove around, my dear drove around, my, everybody drove around, and she cleaned homes for a living. And I grew up in a place called Rancho San Pedro Projects, Rancho San Pedro, and, um, and I had a dream, not a dream, like, ooh, a dream, but I just had this thought, like, I wonder if I can get out of this. I wonder if I can get out of this neighborhood. I wonder if I can do something. I mean, I'm okay with my dad, my dad, and all my uncles, my theos, everybody were longshoremen, and I'm not embarrassed by that. In fact, I'm very proud of their work ethic, and I was proud of my other uncles and cousins that worked at the shipyard, and, and to this day, I'm very proud of that. But I thought to myself, I wonder if I can get out. I wonder if I can get out. I wonder if I can get out. Never said anything to anybody, okay? Uh, ages 14, 15, I'm going to be very transparent. Ages 14, 15, and 16, I got involved in drugs, alcohol, and I learned how to ditch class. I started hanging out with all the guys in the neighborhood. We called ourselves the Persuasions. <laughs> the Persuasions. They're all the Mexican guys in the projects. All the black guys were the monarchs. All the Italian guys were the techniques. And all the, uh, the Slavonians and the white dudes were the chancellors. We were the Persuasions. Frank Guerra, my cousin Chato, Richard, my other cousin Chapulín, Martin, uh, Manuel Luna, Mateo Luna, uh, David Loriva, all these guys. That was my life. Now to you young people, listen, listen, please listen. Don't make the mistake I made. At ages 14, 15, and 16, I was a mess. My mom and dad don't speak the English language. They never went to school. How could they, how could they know anything? Come on. They're not even, they weren't even born in America. How could they know anything? How could my mother and father know anything? I know more than them. I'm 14 years old, are you kidding me? I got a belt at my house right now that's older than 14. You know, but my mom and dad, they didn't know anything. They didn't know anything. My teachers, ah, forget it. My coaches kind of knew <laughs> because they would discipline me. But my mom and dad, my mom, oh man, she would spank me. Boy, she'd grab a, you know, those are a chancla. She'd grab a chancla, <laughs> man, she'd grab anything she could. Bam, 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 okay? But, but I was a rebellious kid, 14, 15, and 16 years of age. By the grace of God, and I mean this sincerely, by the grace of God, the summer before my senior year in high school, I graduated at 17. My mom just threw me in school. <laughs> I graduated at 17 from high school. I got beat up real bad. Broke my cheekbone, broke my ribs, did some damage to my neck, which I'm suffering from now, believe it or not. Right now, even as I speak with you when I turn this way, it kind of hurts. But anyway, uh, I got beat up real bad. And I went to my mom and I went to my dad. Well, my, my mom, my dad worked till 3.30 in the morning. And I went to my mom and said, Mom, listen, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm going to get it figured out. Listen, you young people, I made a lot of bad decisions. Okay? Like I said, I'm going to give you something that you're going to take with you the rest of your life. I made a lot of bad decisions. 14, 15, 16, I made a lot of bad decisions. And I went to my mom and said, listen, I'm going to get it figured out. Just please hang with me. My mom was a prayer warrior, man. My mom loved the Lord. She was a prayer warrior. She led me to my Lord and Savior as well. And man, oh man, my mom said, Neil, just please. And I said, no, mom, I'm going to get it figured out. I'm going to get it figured out. And I remember going to my buddies. We used to hang out at David Lariva's uh, backyard. They had, his dad had this old messed up garage. That was our clubhouse. And I remember walking into those guys and going, hey, guys, you know what, man? I'm out of here. And, and this is crazy, but to get into the persuasions, you got jumped. And to get out, you got jumped. Well, I got jumped to get in because I wanted to be in. Not a very good decision. But I said, hey, and I'm not getting jumped to get out. And they said, no, 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 you're, no, no, no. So I took off. And I isolated myself. That was a hard last year of high school. I quit playing football my senior year because, as you can tell by the size of me, right, I was getting beat up. So I concentrated on baseball and uh, quit playing basketball, quit playing football, and just I'm going to be a baseball player. Okay. Um, I remember telling my buddies, I'm going to junior college. I'd see them in the neighborhood. We always hung out at this place called Bonton Market. Little tiny family store, Mr. Husso, Bob Husso owned it, Mr. Husso. 
And uh, I remember walking down there one day, my mom sent me on an errand, go buy me some, you know, you know, this and that. I went down there, I saw Ruben Lucero, we called him Chief. Looked like an Indian, so we called him Chief. Um, I saw Steve Padilla there, his brother Luther. And, hey man, what's going on? Hey, what are you up to? Hey, we don't see you anymore, what's happening? What's going on? I said, oh man, I'm going to junior college. I hadn't gone yet, but that was my thought. I'm gonna to go to junior college. My grades were horrible. Thank God you didn't get my transcripts, Julius. My grades were horrible. Because I used to ditch. I used to ditch all the time. I used to, I mean, like, it's crazy. I used to ditch like nuts. I stayed just eligible so I could play athletics. That was about it. So I said, I'm going to junior college. And they all looked at me, oh, you think you're too good for us? And I went, no, man, that's not it. Oh, you think you're too good? Okay, yeah, we got it, man. You think you're too good? I said, no, that's, I just want to go to junior college. I'm going to go, I'm going to go play baseball, see what happens. So I go to play, I play there for two years, go to UCLA, play there, get drafted by the Detroit Tigers in the seventh round. And then I become a high school baseball coach, and from there a college coach, and da 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 da. And here I am today. Okay, here I am today. Now here's what I want to give you. Julius said, "Talk about commitment." Okay, commitment. Well, let me share this with you, all you young athletes out there. There's no secret technique. There is no secret technique. It's hard work and repetition. It's hard work. It's if you're a lineman, making sure that your footwork is proper. If you're a quarterback, making sure that your release point is proper. If you're a wide receiver, catch it with your hands. It's, it's repetition after repetition after repetition after repetition. It's coming to practice early. It's staying at practice late. There's no secret technique. There's no secret technique. I've been really blessed. I've coached guys that have won world championships. One of my ex-players right now is probably going to get the job for the Chicago Cubs, David Ross. He caught for me at the University of Florida. He's probably going to be the manager for the Chicago Cubs. I talked to him about a week ago. He's in the running. Got an interview a couple days ago. I've got another player who's playing. Uh, are the Cardinals playing tonight? No, I think they got a day off. But I got another player who's pitching for the St. Louis Cardinals right now. So he may be in the World Series. And every time I remember those young guys, those guys that made it to the big leagues and, and all the rest, I've, I've coached five doctors. Okay, I've got one guy who's a team physician for the Texas Rangers. Okay, but, but every time I remember those guys, all I remember is their commitment to the sport. The word disciple, the word disciple, the etymology, meaning the history of that word, is a disciplined learner. At 14, 15, and 16, I was a disciple on ditching school. I really learned how to ditch school. And then I turned my life around at 17, and I became a disciple of baseball. I wanted to learn everything about it. I want to learn every position. So the first question I'm going to ask you young people, both male and female, is are you a disciple of your sport? Are you committed? Are you trying to learn your sport? Not just your position, but the positions around you. Are you a disciple? I know guys back in my hometown that are disciples of selling drugs. They're really good. They don't get caught. They're disciples. They're disciples. Are you a disciple of your sport? That's commitment. That's commitment. Okay? So we talk about commitment. Okay, now let's talk about the next thing, discipline. I used to say this to my teams all the time. Show me a man or woman, show me a man, again, I raised two daughters, show, well, my wife did, I, I can't take credit for that, my wife raised a girl, but uh, show me a, a, a person, show me a person that has no discipline, they've got a lot of problems, they got a lot of problems, no discipline, you've got a lot of problems, I lived it, I lived, I had no discipline at 14, 15, and 16, problems, Grades, getting to practice on time, uh, getting thrown out of class, uh, getting thrown out of school. Show me a person that doesn't have discipline, I'll show you a person that has a lot of problems. Show me a person that has discipline, no problems. Challenges. Yeah, challenges. Yeah, I got another challenge, I'm gonna be a better player. Yeah, I'm gonna get my degree. In fact, I'm going to get it a year early. I'm going to be the best player in this team. That's a challenge. Because his discipline says, I can do that. Show me a person that has discipline. I'll show you a person that has no problems, but they have challenges. Because we all have challenges in life. But a person with discipline succeeds in those challenges. So you have commitment. 
There's no secret technique. Honestly, it's hard work. You have discipline. And then you have teamwork. Are you a great team person? In other words, do you disappear? When things start going bad, do you disappear? You can't. Well, you can, but then don't ever expect someone to say, great team me. When things go bad, you get better. When things go bad, you encourage more. When things go bad, you work harder. When things go bad, you keep going. I used to have a saying with our guys, when things are going good, play hard. And when things are going bad, what? Play harder. When things are going good, play hard. And when things are going bad, play harder. Okay? All right, I said I was gonna give you something. So here it is, ready? For 38 years, my players, every one of my players, you could, if you go to an airport for some reason, a guy bumps into you and knocks your luggage down, and you look up and you say, hey, and knucklehead, what are you doing? And he looks at you and he says, I'm sorry. And you say, wait a minute, uh, did you play for Coach Lopez at Pepperdine University, Dominguez Hills, Maricosa High School, University of Florida, uh, Japan, Alaska, Korea, Taiwan? Did you play for Coach Lopez? All you're gonna have to do is do this, ready? Ready? 10, 80, 10. The number 10, the number 80, 80, 80, and the number 10. 10, 80, 10. Ask anybody that ever played for me and just say 10, 80, 10, and they'll smile. They'll smile. This is my gift to all of you, to all you young people. Repeat it for me. Come on. Ready? 10, 10 80, 80, 10. Okay, I bid all three. I bid all three. At ages 14, 15, and 16, I was in the low percentile. I was in the bottom 10%. 10, 80, 10. I was in the bottom percent. Playing around with drugs, smoking dope like crazy. Asking old people, not old people, that's big my age then, right? But asking an older, hey, can you buy me some beer? Old English 800, it was real cheap. Can you, can you buy me some beer? Hey, can you do this? Can you do that? I'm not going to class. As soon as my buddy Freddie Lauren would walk out and go like this, come on, we're going to bounce. I'd look at him. When Mr. Bird just turned his back, I boom, ditching class. See, I was in the low 10 percentile. Wasn't listening to my mother. Wasn't paying attention to my teachers. Kind of fighting mentally with my coaches. You know what I mean? Nobody's ever done that, right? Coach tells you to run this way, you go, well, why? Coach tells you you got to work a little extra, you go, you don't say it out loud, but mentally you're going, why? Low 10 percentile. One more time, I gotta make sure you get it. 10, 80, 10, say it, 10, 80, 10. 10, 80, 10. You get it, you get it, okay. Low 10 percentile, I was once in the low 10 percentile. Disobedient, not going to school, not doing my homework, not giving an all effort, an all out effort in practice. Anybody know any, don't raise your hand. Just think for a moment. Anybody know anybody like that in their life right now? A low 10 percentile? Anybody? You know anybody right now that's disobedient? Kind of bad mouth mom and dad, bad mouth their teacher, bad mouth their coach, doesn't do their homework, doesn't work hard at practice, that low 10 percentile? Okay, 80%. See, when I left the persuasions, persuasions I went into the 80%. 17 years old, I'm in the 80% now. I'm not hanging out with the boys. I'm actually going to school. I'm doing some stuff. And I'll never forget, I never forget Miss Yamamoto, my uh, counselor at San Pedro High School. She said, uh, she used to call everybody by their first name, proper name. Andrew, what is your plan for the second semester? Shoulder shrug. I'll do, I'll exaggerate for you. Ready? Watch my shoulders. I don't know. Low 10 percentile, then you have the 80 percentile. Shoulder shrugs. Hey, you gonna go to school tomorrow and get that thing done? I don't know. Hey, you gonna you gonna you gonna work a little extra today at practice and maybe get better at that uh, that running that route, or you gonna work a little extra and do a little bit better with this? I don't know. 80 percentile. You know what it's called? You can't even make it sound good. Ready, get ready, here it's called, 80 percentile. Remember the low 10 percentile, nobody in here is on a low percentile. Nobody in here is a scholarship night. Nobody here is a low 10 percentile, I know that. But I bet you know someone, I can speak honestly because I was there. 
Okay, now 80 percentile. Ooh, that might, you know, it might get a little interesting now. You know what 80 percentile is? Average. You can't even make it sound good. Average. I'm going to try to make it sound good. Average. <laughs> Doesn't even sound good. Average. Average. 80 percentile is average. 80 percentile is average. I got there, and I thought I was doing pretty good. Yeah, I'm not as bad as him. I ain't like him. I used to be like him, but I'm not like him. And then one day it hit me. I want to be great. I want to be excellent. I want to get out of this town. I want to go do something. I want to go do something that no one's ever done. I remember, I'll never forget the day I was sitting at Peck Park where I used to go and smoke dope and then ditch class. And I was sitting there by myself because I went for a run. And it hit me. I said, you know what? Why can't I be that guy? Why can't I get out? Why can't I go to a big time school? Why can't I do something? Why, can, why, why does it have to be that guy? Why does it have to be that person from that school? Why can't it be me? And like a lightning bullet hit me. You know why it can't be you, Andy? Because right now you're average. You're in the 80 percentile. Get ready for the last percent. 10 percent. Remember, it's 10, 80, what? 10. 10, 80, 10. High 10 percentile. High 10 percentile. Always on time. Always doing it right. Staying after practice. Coming early to practice. Getting their assignments in. Listening to the mother, listening to the father, listening to the coaches, listening to the teachers. It's a habit of excellence. I went from a guy that was in the low 10 percentile by the grace of God. Now, by the grace of God and my mother and father's prayers and my grandmother as well. I went from a guy that was 14, 15, and 16 in the low 10 percentile to sitting at Peck Park one day in 1971 and saying, I want to get out of town. I love my hometown. You ask anybody that plays for me, they also tell you that every road trip, I wore t-shirts that said San Pedro on them. I got a buddy of mine that was in the Persuasion, Eddie Nunez, and he got a, has a t-shirt shop back in San Pedro. So every time I'd go into Pedro, I'd get like 10 or 15 t-shirts. So I, I love the town that I grew up in, but I needed to get out of that town. So I went from a guy that was in a low 10 percentile to a guy that's been invited to the White House three times and has been inducted into 19 Hall of Fames. What? I don't say that in arrogance. I say that in awe. Like, are you kidding me? There's days when I go out and take our dog out to do his thing at 10 o'clock at night, look up at the stars and go, wow, Lord, you have to be real. Look at my life. You have to be real. But you know what? In 1971, I said, I want to be in the high 10 percentile. I want to be in the high 10 percentile. So every day of my life, before I go to bed, I ask my, I'm 66 years old, I look in the mirror, I brush my teeth right before I go to bed, and I ask myself, hey Andy, what percentile today? Today, Andy, low 10%? Thank God I'm not in the low 10% very often, very often. 80%, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I'm in the 8%. And really. When my wife says, let's go shopping, I'm in the 80%. I'm in the 80%. I want to watch that housewife show. Ooh, man, I'm on the 80%. You know, Orange County Housewives, I'm out. I'm in the 80%. But you know what? When I say, yeah, babe, let's go. In fact, I'll drive you and I'll walk around with you and I'll really, yeah, let's do it. I jump into the high 10%. A habit of excellence. So right now, I'm going to finish on this thought. Do you know anybody that's in the low 10 percentile? Just think. Try to help that person get out of it. Thank God for the people that tried to help me get out of it. Do you know anybody that's in the 80 percentile? Average. They think they're going great. Help them. Push them. Push them. Push them up a little bit. And the last thing is, do you know anybody that's in the high 10 percentile? They're always on time, they're always doing it right, they're always getting after it, they stay before practice, they stay late for practice, they come early for practice, or whatever. Do you know anybody like that? If you do, start hanging around them 
a lot. Spend all your time with them. And if you're that high ten percentile, don't slip. Don't slip. True story. In 2008, I had two pitchers that were drafted the 15th pick in the nation and the 14th pick in the nation. They were first-round draft picks. One guy signed for $3.5 million, and the other guy signed for $4.2 million. Anybody that knows baseball, they would pitch the sixth and seventh innings. And then the eighth and ninth innings, I would give the ball to a young guy that wasn't draft eligible. Now, you understand that? Especially if anybody's a Dodger fan. Anyway, you understand that? You understand that? In other words, that guy, I'll leave their names out because it's a true story. I would give the ball to this guy to pitch the sixth inning. He got $4.2 million. And then after he pitched an inning or so, I'd give the ball to this guy, and he got $3.5 million. And when they got done to get our last six outs of the game, I'd give the ball to this individual over here. Ready? So that tells me that these two guys were signed for a million dollars, but this is the guy we gave the most important outs to, so this guy must have been better than these guys. Huh? Make sense? This guy was better than these guys. This guy. This guy flunked out of the University of Arizona because he played video games. Be careful. Be careful when you're talented. This guy was more talented than two first rounders. And he flunked out his junior year because he stayed in his apartment and played video games. I can say that now because I'm retired. Back then I couldn't say it. He played video games. He was a disciple of video games. He cost himself millions of dollars. These two guys pitched in the big leagues. These two guys pitched in the big leagues. One for Detroit and one for Cleveland. This guy's never seen the big leagues in his life. But if you take me back to 2008, I'm gonna tell you right now, this guy over here, the video game guy, way better than these two guys. But he was missing something. He was in the 80 percentile. These two guys, high 10%. 108010, thank you so much for having me. Congratulations to all of you. Unbelievable accomplishment. Stay with it. And to the parents and all the people that do this, God bless you guys. You're making an impact on the young life. God bless you.